Ljetnu školu aktivno radi u suorganizaciji sa sveučilištem u Rijeci i Centrom za napredne studije jugoistočne Evrope. Ja im se naravno ovom prilikom želim zahvaliti što su aktivno prepoznali vrijednog programskog partnera. Vjerujem da je to zato što dijelimo neke iste vrijednosti i nastojanja ideje, vjeru u širenje znanja, kulture, tolerancije i propitivanje bitnih društvenih tema. Večeras propitujemo sekularnost, feminizam. Meni je jako, jako drago što su večeras s nama i to činimo prisjećajući se posljednjeg dijela Sabe Mahmud. I meni je drago što je večeras ovdje s nama niz uglednih znanstvenica. Ja vas molim da ih pozdravite pljeskom. Dakle, živim vaše. Judith Butler, Rebeka Anić, Zilka Spahić-Šiljak, Sanja Potkodnjak, moderira Sanja Boranić i tu je naravno i Senka Božić. Dakle, hvala im svima što su došli, što će danas pričati s nama o sekularnosti i feminizmu. A nakon okruglog stola slijedi jedan kratki film. Riječ je o filmu, odnosno video radu Semiotika kuhinje pionirskom radu feminističkog video arta. Vjerujem da ćete uživati i u projekciji i u okruglom stolu, nakon čega slijedi naravno kratko druženje u atriju. Hvala još jednom, dobrodošli, uživajte u filmu, uživajte u okruglom stolu. Dobro večer, jako mi je drago da smo se okupili i da prepoznajem poznate lice u publici. Sam okrugli stol ili ovaj ravni stol će biti sniman, da znate i zbog ovog novog zakona o zaštiti osobnih podataka, moje dužnost obavijestiti vas o tome. Vi nećete biti snimani. Meni je jako, jako drago da smo ovo večer posvetili radu Sabe Mahmud i naročito mi je drago da je to u stvari bila i želja naše gošće koji ste već imali prilike čuti i u kazalištu, sinući u vječnici i koje je naravno vrlo jasno već izgovorila neke stavove o kojima ćemo i večeras vjerujem govoriti, ali njena večerašnja uloga će biti u tome da kaže nešto više o samom Sabi Mahmud i postoji jedna dobra koincidencija za koju bih sad zamolila u svoju žuzik, ne aj? Say about Saba and Kitchen? Yes. Ok. U stvari koincidencija je u tome da ćemo mi vidjeti jedan kracak film o semiotici kuhinje, a da u stvari ja nisam znala i niti mi iz organizacijskog odbora nismo znali da je Saba bila izvršna kuharica i da je jako, jako puno držala do začina. Te tako se nadam da će ovo naše veče biti jedan od tih začina koji će ići u njoj učasnju. Predstavila bi hvala lijepa. Ja bih sada samo vam rekla redoslijed sa kojim ćemo mi naše sagovodnice večeras poslušati. Najprije ćemo naravno dati riječ našoj gošći Judith Butler. Potom će nam Rebeka Anić reći nešto više o svom doživljaju feminizma, ali također i o sekularnosti. Zatim ćemo imati priliku čuti gošu iz Sarajeva, Zilku Spahić-Šiljak. Potom će nam gošće iz Beograda, Adrijan Zakarijević i naša domačica je gošća, kako god. Adrijana Zakarijević nešto više reći, zatim Seta Božić-Vrbančić, da bi Sanja 
koja će referirati na senci grada u održanoj mjeri završila sa ovom našom pričom. Ovako, sad ću malo preći na engleski da bi Edvarda Đođevića koja nam pomože u celoj ovoj situaciji malo mu pomogla. Jadranka Rebeka Anić, holds a PhD from the Catholic Theological Faculty University of Vienna. She works at the Institute of Social Sciences Sigur Pilar Regional Center in Split as a scientific advisor. She taught religion and gender as part of the MA in Religious Studies uh, program at the University of Sarajevo. As a visiting professor, she taught a course at the Department of Sociology, University of Zadar, and the Faculty of Theology, Matija Vlačić Ilirik, University of Zagreb. The member of the European Society of Women in Theological Research Board. She is also vice president of the Croatian section of the European Society of Women in Theological Research. She has uh, published a number of papers in the field of feminist theology, including books More Than Duty, Women in the Church in Croatia in 20th Century, Women in Church and Society, How to Understand Gender, The History of Discussions and Different Understanding understandings in the church. Now, Zilka Spahic-Shiljak holds a PhD in Gender Studies from the University of Novi Sad, and her scope of work includes addressing cutting-edge issues involving human rights, politics, religion, education, and peace building, with more than 15 years' experience in academic teaching and working governmental and non-governmental sectors. She runs TPO Foundation Sarajevo and teaches at several universities and in Bosnia and Herzegovina and abroad. As postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard University, she published the book Shining Humanity, Life Stories of Women, Peace Buildings in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, published by uh, Cambridge Scholars Publishing, but also contesting female, feminist, and Muslim identities, post-socialist context of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo, um, published in Sarajevo, then Women, Religion and Politics. Her current research at Stanford University focuses on the intersection of leadership, gender and politics. Then I come to Adriana Zaharijevic, dear friend, who graduated philosophy at the Faculty of Philosophy, University of Belgrade. She obtained her PhD at the Faculty of Political Sciences, University of Belgrade, combining political philosophy, feminist theory and social history of the 19th century. In 2013, Zagreb became a researcher at the Institute of Philosophy and Social Theory. And uh, in 2016, assistant professor at the University of Novi Sad. She's the author of more than 60 articles and two books, Becoming Woman, Woman in 2010, and uh, who is an individual genealogical inquiry into the idea of a citizen in 2014. The present theoretical interests lie in the field of critical engagement. Our friend from Zadar, Zagreb, Senka Božić Vrbančić, uh, had her PhD in 2004 on uh, socio cultural anthropology at the Auckland University in New Zealand. She worked at Auckland, uh, but also in Melbourne as a MacArthur Research Fellow uh, in the University of Lavrov in Ukraine, and uh, also uh, as a researcher in the Institute for Anthropology in Zagreb, but actually uh, she is teaching at the Department of Ethnology and Anthropology in Zadar, uh, University of Zadar. Um, she's also associated uh, a member of uh, the uh, University of Melbourne. So the uh, main uh, focus of her research are uh, visual, visual cultures, politics of sentimentality, and politics of difference, uh, ethnical, gender, and class difference. She published uh, in numerous uh, papers, uh, including books on Tarara, memory, belonging, identity, and also uh, Hitchcocking Gaze. Hitchcocking Gaze. Uh, then uh, I am here with Sanja Potvonek, uh, who is an assistant professor of ethnology and anthropology at the Department of Ethnology and Cultural Anthropology, Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, University of Zagreb. She stands as department chair and deputy head of the PhD program. Her main research field are policy methodology and ethics, post-socialism, transformation of rural cultures and gender studies. 
Uh, her publications include the book Fieldwork for Practice Ethnographers and the book Thinking Ethnographically, Qualitative Strategies and Methods in Ethnology and Cultural Anthropology. And this is it with the presentation of our uh, colleagues and speakers. Um, I presume that I, am, I have no need to present our guest, Judith Butler. Thank you. And uh, um, why I did this long presentation, because actually women do work and do intellectual work uh, and have an important influence on what uh, we are uh, living uh, through these difficult times. Uh, so I do believe that you will enjoy this uh, um, this uh, event as much as I am looking forward uh, to enjoy it myself. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I am very glad to be here this evening to pay tribute uh, to the memory of my friend, Sabah Mahmoud. And um, she died, uh, as you know, in uh, March of this year of pancreatic cancer um, after struggling for about two years with the illness. Um, and I got to know Saba. I've known Saba for maybe 20 years, but um, we became closer in the last two years as we took walks together. And um, she wanted to talk to me about death. Um, and so that's what we did. We talked about other things too. We talked about politics, we laughed, we cooked, we had a good time, but she wanted to have a sustained reflection on death. She didn't want to meet death with fear. She wanted to understand what she was going towards. And um, she was unafraid of this topic. Um, as you know, she was the author um, of, uh, of two major books, one of which um, uh, dealt um, with um, the, the politics of piety and the feminist subject, which reflected her fieldwork in Egypt with um, different women's groups that were involved in interpreting the Quran. Um, and she um, also, in that book, uh, sustained a reflection on secularism and asked why it is we assume that secularism is the appropriate frame for feminism, feminist thought, feminist agency. Um, and she um, focused there on embodied practices of interpreting and relating to the Quran as a holy text um, that she understood as forms of thinking, forms of interpretation, but also as embodied ethical relations to a text. Um, so when so many uh, feminists, especially I must say in Northern Europe, um, decided that Muslim women uh, are obedient subjects who do not think, uh, or who have who have no capacity for agency or have no capacity for intellectual work because they are nothing but subjected to their men. Um, Salva Mahmoud uh, argued that actually um, there are um, active ways of interpreting and embodying a religious uh, connection to uh, the Quran that um, affects and is manifest in bodily practices of an everyday sort, and that we can find their agency, we can find their ethics, we can find their politics, and we can find their in important forms of embodied interpretation. So she gave interpretation an embodied form, but she also gave dignity um, to Muslim women, and I think there was a kind of uh, reverberation throughout the world, as I understand it, because since her death, I've received now messages from all over the world where people have honored her and written about her. 
um, especially in Pakistan, where she was declared the most important Pakistani intellectual of our time. What I thought I would do today, um, rather than talk to you about her second book, uh, Religious Difference in a Secular Age, which is about Coptics, Coptic Christians in Egypt who are a minority. She's kind of shifted the frame and talked about how, in, in that book, she very importantly considers uh, ways of negotiating religious difference that do not involve um, seeking recourse to a secular law. Okay, an extremely interesting problem. She also shows in that book how secularism and the process of secularization in Egypt produces religious conflict and then pretends as if it's settling it. Okay, you know all about this here. Um, but today, if I may take up just a little bit of time, I want to read from her last article, which is called Humanism. Uh, which is coming out in the Journal of Ethnographic Theory. She gave this at the American Anthropology Association meetings in, I believe, November of this last year, um, December 1st, I apologize, uh, through Skype. And um, I just want to read you some paragraphs because these were her, this was her final intellectual contribution. In this text, she has a struggle with um, a version of humanism. Can you understand me? Am I going too quickly? No. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. It's good that I asked. Right? You know, these Americans call them, they mumble, they go really fast. Okay. Um, the version of humanism she wants to address she says, goes something like this. Man is the author of his own actions and representations, not fate, God, or some other force or entity. That through the exercise of his will and reason, he establishes his own norms and laws. Furthermore, according to this same version of humanism, not only is man the author, but he is also the ultimate end of his actions, not superhuman entities like gods or abstract values or principles. In one important version of this tradition, human flourishing is the ultimate goal that one should strive for without reference to something higher or other than one's own well-being. It is important to point out that this is not an individualist notion, but one that can easily incorporate collective conceptions of human flourishing. Death, of course, she writes, poses a particular problem to this conception of humanism in that it marks the end of what is the ultimate and perhaps only measure of life and well-being, namely the human itself. The power of the human is humbled when faced with death. Death marks the end of meaning, one might say, indeed, of representation itself, and consequently, is either incomprehensible in the imminent frame of this humanist tradition or something to be warded off at all costs and until the last possible moment. We do not need to think very hard to find evidence of this attitude toward death in a range of modern societies, whether in today's endless celebration of life and youth or in the banishment of death from bourgeois society as described by, by Philippe Arrier and evident today in the sequestering of the aged within the confines of hospitals and senior centers, or in the waning of the many rituals of mourning and the public disquisitions on death. Yet, she writes, it seems to me that despite this modern attitude toward the banishment of ordinary death, we are surrounded by mass catastrophic death. One cannot open a newspaper or turn on the television without encountering the death of masses of people, whether by famine, genocide, or war. So how is it possible for modern societies, with their celebration of life, their neglect of human mortality, and celebration of human flourishing, to tolerate mass 
catastrophic death so easily? That is the question that was asked at the termination of the two world wars when human beings engaged so wantonly in the mass killings of fellow humans, visiting unimaginable suffering and horror on each other. And then she, she reviews a number of philosophers who have, um, who have considered this question. Um, and, um, and she remarks that Marc Crepon, who was with us yesterday, argues um, that philosophers have for the most part uh, ruminated on the experience of the two world wars um, taken together um, in order to make a crucial reassessment of what death by murder means in relation to ourselves and in regard to our attitude about our own and others' demise. Um, there's a double imperative, uh, Salva writes, that binds one to the other, even as the other moves to extinguish my life. As long as my death is the result of another's action, then my death is no longer simply mine. On the other hand, my recognition that my life is vulnerable to the other's will to kill makes me recognize the interdiction against murder and attunes me to the ultimate ethical responsibility I face namely responding to the other's cry for life. As Crepon puts it, in the dual pincer of this realization, the other's vulnerability takes priority over the concern with my own death. This reflection on the reversal of my care for myself in the face of the other's annihilation has been enormously productive for a range of ethicists and theorists. But here, one might ask, does mass murder and catastrophic death continue to occur in this world because of the lack of empathy for the other? Or does it prosper for political reasons that have little to do with the lack of concern for the other? When I look around at the inaction of world powers to stop mass starvation, rampant in Yemen today, for example, or the genocide conducted in Aleppo and Raqqa recently, I doubt that these failures of action resulted from a lack of a proper ethical orientation. While some may have not been moved by the images the media projected to the world, there is no lack of empathy among most of the world's inhabitants for these catastrophes. These events unfolded owing to political reasons that require a different analytic than one focused on our lack of care for the other. One might also note that members of ISIS frequently claim that it is precisely their empathy for the victims of Western-supported violence in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen that justifies their visitation of murder and mayhem on what they charge are the perpetrators of this originary violence. Empathy, in other words, is no guarantee of an interdiction against murder, but may well serve as an impetus to it. She never stopped provoking us, okay, I'm just saying. <laughs> Finally, Levinas attempts to temper and tame what Freud, at the end of World War I, diagnosed as the death drive in the human psyche within the ethical realm, cries out for a rethinking of the relationship between the ethical and the political. It also requires an unpacking of the changing conceptions of death, ours and others, engendered by transformations in conditions of mass death. Anthropology is in some ways better suited to think about this than other disciplines, not only because it brings a certain demand of the particular to bear on the universality of the philosophical, but more importantly, because it offers us a way to think outside of the self-certain claims of humanism in all their variety. The recent turn in anthropology to theorizing about ontology in relation to the Anthropocene is one attempt at trying to address humanism's conceits. Yet, for the reasons already elaborated earlier, it seems to me that the ontological turn is not quite adequate for the task of rethinking humanism's relation to death. If there is one thing that the efforts of 20th century philosophy has taught us, it is that the question of death cannot be contained within the problematic of ontology. And then she writes, we live and die socially. 
and the meaning of death cannot be fixed a priori without regard for the relationships that give it shape. Death unfolds within the distinct social context wherein it occurs. So my invitation here to anthropologists is to think through the emergent meanings death is now acquiring in the context of the mass <coughs> catastrophic death that surrounds us. Well, those are the end, end of her remarks, but I must say it is very moving that this person, in confrontation with her own death, decided that what was most important to think about was mass catastrophic death. Thank you. So Saba is with us uh, with that uh, word uh, and syntagma, we'll live and die socially. And uh, I do think that uh, now uh, talking about uh, this, uh, also this state of social uh, living and dying together, uh, Rebecca, uh, from your perspective, uh, you could absolutely uh, tell us more uh, about it. Hvala puno, Rebecca, ovo je bio poziv u stvari da čujemo i tu perspektivu koja je specifična i vaša i vjerujem da sigurno imate puno toga za reći. Ja sam ovaj tekst pripremala negdje od moje osobe, ne znam neći kako će se skupa izgledati, ne znam neći za ovaj tekst koji će vam prethoditi i zapravo sam u trenutku ću malo promijeniti pa ću vam sad i niska raditi. Htjela bi ovo reći, u predstavljanju izostavljeno je to da se nja redovnica, školska sestra Frendika, znači katoliška redovnica, namjerno to nisam napisala u tekst, jer u zadnje vrijeme se postavlja pitanje kad govorim u čije ima govori. Kao da moja zajednica očekuje da se ogradu, da ona se ograđuje od mene i od mojeg govora, upravo u kontekstu ovakve pitanja kao što su pitanje feminizma, pitanje roda. I onda mogu reći uistinu, ja ne govorim u ime moje zajednice školske sa stara Franjevaka, ali govorim iz duha Franjevačke tradicije a taj duh je pražena granica. Franjo ide iz tabora križara, odlazi do... Sultana, i s njim razgovara i pokušava uspostaviti mir. I ono što mene fascinira u radu Sade Mahmudi, upravo to dolažene granice, nadilažene dihotomije. U ovom slučaju je želim da naglasiti to nadilaženje dikotomije sekularno-religijsko. I mislim da je to ključni trenutak u feminizmu, da nadižemo te granice i da zajedno surađujemo. Ne samo zbog toga što se nanosi, pa ja ću ovako malo reći, nepravda na feminističkim teologinjama i ljednicama aktivistkinjama, jer njihov rad na takav način ostaje nevidljiv u povijesti feminizma, zanimaluje se, iako su sami početaka bile aktivne u feminističkom pokretu i to u istinu nadahnute svojom religijom. Zato što u današnjem svijetu mislim da puno gubimo ukoliko ne surađujemo. Ja želim ovaj hermenovski princip Sade Mahmud, u kojem ona nadilazi tu dihotomiju, aktualizirati u sadašnji trenutak u cijelom svijetu, u Evropi, osobito u Hrvatskoj, gdje imamo snažan antirodni pokret, u kojem imamo situaciju da se vjernici udružuju u sekularne udruge, ne argumentiraju vjerskim argumentima, nego se pozivaju na znanost, znači idu u jedan sekularni diskurs, da bi zapravo postigli neke vjerske cilje. Ukoliko mi kao feministinje ne njegujemo suradnju, ne izmijenimo znanje, ne izmijenimo informacije, 
onda zapravo nećemo dobro razumjeti zbilju i nećemo znati na nje odgovoriti. Ja sam u ovom današnjem izlaganju ne bih htjela ukazati na nešto, da mi zapravo u srcu same religije, uzela sam primjer kršćanstva i islama, imamo jedan sekularni, a ne religijski argument ili princip kad se radi o manjim vredovanju žene. Tu se poziva na istraživanje John Scott, koja se kaže da su sekularisti makli Boga kao posljednu istancu i postavili prirodu. Ona tu se poziva na francusku revoluciju i ona kaže zapravo žene su maknute iz političkog života, ne pozivajući se na Boga, nego ne pozivajući se na prirodu. Čitala sam našeg hrvatskog sociologa Željka Martešića koji kaže da prvu sekularizaciju samo sebi napravila je crkva kada je prihvatila Aristotela, rimsko pravo i državno uređenje. I ja vidim zapravo ovu prirodu. Priroda to je zapravo temelj rodnih stereotipa. I tu zapravo imamo negdje Aristotela i njegovo tumačenje njegovo dijeljenje aktivno i pasivno u procesu rađenja, teore rađenja. Na ženama je počela taj princip pasivnosti, muškarci su aktivni, skolastici, znači teolozi kršćanski to preuzimaju i na temelju toga grade cijelu kršćansku antropologiju. I onda sad kad pogledate, znači ako bi smo išli od Biblije, ako bi smo išli od Kurana, Znači, mi u Bibliji, mi u Kuranu nemamo definicije prirode, nigdje se ne definira narav priroda žene, nemamo određenja, nemamo jedan otvoreni koncept. U Bibliji se govori o stvaranju muško i žensko na sliku Božju. Ne muškarac i žena, muško i žensko, znači jedan otvoreni koncept. I Biblija i Kuran, tu je moja kolegica Zilika, nas dvije zajedno radimo i onda to negdje i istražujemo u vlastitim tradicijama i izmjenjujemo, daju nam mogućnosti za jedan egalitarni rodni model. I onda sad imamo u antirodnom pokretu zastupanje kršćanske antropologije, zapravo obranu rodnih stereotipa, i onda se kaže koliko profitujemo rodne stereotipa, mi rušimo kršćansku antropologiju. Ja bih rekla ne, mi je oslobađamo. Mi zapravo vraćamo religiju, vjeru, kršćanstvo, islam, njima samima. Mi imamo mogućnost drugačijeg uređenja. Još jedan razlog je za to. Kad smo u katoličkoj teologiji, nijedna filozofija nema povlašteno mjesto. Nijednu filozofiju mi ne možemo uzeti kao vlastitu. Nego sa svim filozofijama mi smo u razgovoru i teologi se čak kaže da je filozofija službenica teologije. To znači mi imamo pravo postaviti Aristotela u pitanje i ne trebamo se toga boljeti. Eto, to je ono što sam htjela u ovom izlaganju naglasiti i mislim da tu smo negdje na tragu Sabe Mahmud koja nadilazi dihotomiju, ona istražuje tradiciju i sekularnog i religijskog ukazuje na međusobna ispredvetanja. I nemojte zamijeniti ako završi s jednom tvrdnjom novinarke iz pisateljice Klaudije Keller, koja je možda onako malo ošte. Ona kaže ovako, strogi, strikni sekularni feminizam, koji se unosi prema religiji sa skepsom i neprijateljstvom, provincijalni je i nema budućnosti u globalnom množenom 20. prostoriću. Ja bih to dodala, ja bih tome dodala da mi je striktno religijski feminizam, koji se zatvara u vlastite konfesionalne granice i stavlja u opoziciju prema sekularnom feminizmu, nema budućnosti. Imamo zapravo budućnost u trenutku kad je znanost intersekcionalna i bila u zajedničkom suradnju. Hvala puno, Rebeka. Hvala puno, Rebeka. I do think that this is the very spirit of Saba Mahmud crossing borders and uh, I presume that uh, Judith is inspired to say a word or not yet? <laughs> not yet. Okay, good, good, good. Then uh, we are going to uh,
hear now Zilka. But I, I do see here uh, three monotheisms. Huh? Uh, the third is not named, but it's there. <laughs> So hello everyone. I'm also glad that I'm part of uh, this discussion in tribute to Saba Mahmoud. Uh, and I would like to thank the organizers, uh, particularly to Sanya and Adriana, who invited Rebecca and me to be part of uh, the summer school. And Rebecca uh, wrapped up the very good what two of us have been doing in the last decade in the Balkans trying um, to uh, bring religious perspective and feminist theology and religious feminism and in public discourse and then to open debate with the secular feminism. So um, uh, it's important to bridge uh, these gaps and, and, and divisions, uh, the godmies, and also to cross the borders and boundaries particularly those boundaries that we have uh, uh, in our mindsets, not the, only the physical one. Um, as someone who uh, is feminist, and I declare myself as Muslim feminist, uh, for me it is important to collaborate uh, uh, with secular feminists and to exchange ideas and to work together on gender equality and uh, uh, to um, fight uh, discrimination, exclusion, and all discriminatory practices. But we also need to uh, hear each other and then provide floor uh, to debate every question. It is also important in, in feminist production of knowledge because I believe that feminist production of knowledge is artificially divided uh, on secular and religious, and no one uh, uh, get anything uh, out of it because the, the legitimacy of feminist production of knowledge in academia and in women's uh, organizations uh, uh, is still not uh, is still not getting uh, recognition. So the collaboration is important for all of us. So I'd like to say something now about uh, my encounter with Saba Mahmoud's work. I had a chance to meet her twice. First, when I read her book, uh, The Politics of Piety, uh, The Islamic Revival of the Feminist Subject, that was published in 2004. So Judith said something about this book. And this book was very influential and uh, uh, in informative base uh, for myself and for many of my students because for the first time uh, we uh, could think about the agency and freedom and resistance in a different way. Uh, the second encounter happened in 2011. It was in person uh, at the Arizona State University Conference um, when I introduced myself as Muslim feminist and not as Islamic feminist. And she was intrigued by that fact and she immediately asked me why. <laughs> why not Islamic feminist and uh, you declare yourself as Muslim feminist. And then I try to explain to her that for me, um, the Quran, my holy book, uh, is important point of reference, but this is not the only one. So, and for me, living in uh, two secular, uh, uh, secular state, socialist and ethno-nationalist after the war in 1990s, um, showed me basically what uh, politics can do when uh, exploit religion for daily politics and how uh, religion can be used to empower but also to disempower uh, women. So I personally witnessed that and then I was talking about the, the social, political and economic rights of women in the socialist time and uh, my argument was that women uh, in the socialist time in the 70s and 80s including Muslim women uh, had more rights than women uh, after 1990s. And one of uh, 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 the, the, to, to support this argument, what has happened to us in 1990s that, for instance, after the first democratic elections uh, in our countries, particularly in Bosnia, 
the political participation of women was reduced from 24% to 2%. So just that data shows us basically what has happened to us with, with, with the ethno-nationalist ideologies who came uh, to power. So then um, uh, we were about to enter the conference room uh, and in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, she said, uh, it's really interesting to me to see an observant Muslim woman uh, but she feels more comfortable in secular setting than in her own religious tradition. We should uh, definitely continue this discussion. But that very day, <clears throat> she got a call from home. Her son was sick and she had to go back immediately. So we didn't have opportunity to delve deeper into this uh, uh, teams. Uh, so uh, uh, what I like about Saba Mahmoud's work is that she dared to challenge assumptions that were and are still taken for granted. One of them is the assumption of uh, uh, secularism and religion. And uh, the, we already mentioned uh, her book, Religious Difference in a Secular Age, Minority Report. Uh, she uh, basically confronts the conventional idea about belief that secularism commonly understood as separation of religion from state or the absence of religion from public life would help reduce social, political inequalities and religious tensions in some corners of the world. So what we could have seen, that was not the case. So she also uh, found contradictions in secular governance because under the claims to religious neutrality, uh, secular states attempt to regulate and interfere in religious life, and there are uh, many examples of that. I would also like to draw uh, our attention a bit to her book, Is Critique Secular?, co-authored with Judith Butler and Talal Assad, Blasphemy, uh, Injury and Free Speech, when Danish cartoons, Controversy was Raging, so Mahmoud claimed that, and I quote her, Stru uh, uh, struggles over religious difference cannot simply be settled by the heavy hand of the law. She was puzzled by the fact that the kind of injury expressed by ordinary pious Muslims didn't find any voice in polemical debates in either the Islamic or European press. She asked, if it was because the religiosity expressed by most Muslims in response to the Danish cartoons was incommensurable with the language of rights, litigation, and boycotts that came to dominate the debate. So together with Talal Assad, she showed how secularism functions to structure our moral responses within the dominant Western context. So there is more than one dominant Western uh, normative uh, framework, uh, Saba Mahmoud claimed, in which we understand and evaluate certain uh, concepts and phenomena, and in this uh, case of Danish cartoons, freedom of, of speech and uh, freedom of religion. Uh, another as assumption uh, that uh, was already mentioned uh, by Judith here uh, uh, was about uh, feminist understanding of agency, uh, which assumed the universal uh, meaning of both agency and freedom. So, so her ethnographic research in mosques in Cairo, in Egypt, uh, demonstrated how these women were engaged in rebuilding the pious Islamic community. So they didn't want to leave it alone to men, setting aside the traditional uh, female roles of mothers and nurturers. Uh, they were uh, engaged as teachers and knowledge producers in their communities. So their intervention was not in the arena of politics, but in social and ethical life that later had impact on the political condition uh, in Egypt. So Saba Mahmoud posed very interesting questions uh, uh, for all of us uh, after uh, this ethnographic research. How we think of women who refer to their holy book, in this case, of women in Egypt who refer to their Quran, uh, who accept veiling uh, as an aspiration and seek uh, to find a discipline with five uh, times a day prayer. Are they immediately radical, subjugated, discriminated? and cry for rescue? Or can they be agents, 
of their own lives within the patriarchal structure they have decided to intervene. So liberal feminist critique failed to recognize religious women from the pious movement and Egypt as agents, but as mere objects that need help. Salomon Hood challenged feminist emancipatory mandate to end feminist politically prescriptive concepts of agency that was conflated with resistance. For liberal feminists, prescribing norms through embodied practices such, such as hijab could never be seen as agency but as an act of resistance. Similar, similarly, similar uh, situation uh, had uh, Lila Bulugod and other um, uh, Muslim anthropologists when she did her ethnographic research with Bedouin women in the Middle East. And she said, uh, she questioned the, the theoretical impulses uh, to look uh, up the traits of resistance instead of looking the traits of power and agency. But she proposed later a middle ground basically to interpret uh, the resistance as a kind of uh, uh, power and agency of, of, of these women. So I will stop here and I hope we'll have uh, more time for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zelka. Um, it's just um, to uh, lead you through this extremely dense and uh, nice um, um, path of uh, Catholic through Islam and through uh, other uh, directions. I might just add this difference between secularism and secularity, which is also uh, Sabas, uh, uh, in, in her work she developed uh, into uh, detail uh, the difference between regulation, which is belonging to secularism, and then sensibility, uh, uh, which covers this uh, uh, much a uh, more much broader uh, aspect of secularity. Uh, now we are going towards Adriana and uh, please. Thank you, Sonia. Before you started explaining the difference, I thought you were going to say now, after Catholicism and Islam, we're going to introduce Serbian Orthodox Church. <laughs> Thank you for not saying that. Thank you for not saying that. Um, uh, I will just say a couple of words in, in, Ser in Ser uh, these languages that we all speak and understand, and then I will switch again to, to English. A htjela sam samo da napomenem da je 20. aprila, dakle pre tačno dva meseca, tačno u sedam sati, kao što večera se ovdje sedimo, se dogodila naša rasprava u Sarajevu, na kojoj smo zapravo bile Rebeka i ja, bilo kao u publici, ali kao neko ko nas je sazvao na tom mestu, gdje smo upravo razgovarali o reči koja je vrlo najviše puta do sada pomenuta, sradnja ili kolaboracija, Ja moram da kažem da sam se osjećala malo neobično kao pozvana da branim sekularizam, boje sekularnosti, sekularizma, što mi daleko lakše ide nego ovog drugog što sam malo prepomenula, sve što se pravo sam u crkve. A da bismo onda završili zapravo sa idejom da su i ta pitanja koja uzmemo zdravo za gotovo, dakle da sam prosto došla sa idejom da su sekularnosti i feminizam nešto što ide, što se podrazumeva da ide zajedno, da to nije baš tako i da je u stvari potreba za kolaboracijom i razumevanjem uzak u igri. Saba Mahmud je u tom smislu nekog ko na najbolji način poziva da to razumemo i ja ću sad da prijeći na engleski zbog naših gošći i gostiju koji ne razumeju ove naše jezike, propitujući upravo vlastitu poziciju sa kojom sam otišla u Sarajevo i sa kojom dosta nelagodno živim i inače. So I wish to go back to Saba Mahmoud's book, Politics of Piety, mentioned several times, which was for me personally, to repeat now again Zilka's words, formative, but has also uh, served an important function in presenting and presenting as questionable 
as something that needs to be put in question, never taken for, for granted. The issues of freedom, equality, and agency. When I discussed them with gender studies students in the first feminist post-colonial classes in Serbia. Why introducing post-colonial theory via Mahmoud and not say via Spivak or Baba? Well, I have to say honestly that uh, Chandra Mohanty's third world difference served as well in thinking about our own second world difference and our own post-socialist European political peripheral position. So if you allow me, I would say a few words more about the reading material for that course because it also says something about the position of ourselves at the beginning of the last decade when this uh, course was introduced, or not course, but one, one class. Uh, Maria Mejel Lucas, a vocal opponent of fundamentalism and a friend of women in black in Belgrade, and I guess you all know them, um, I would say they're a friend, um, whose secularist position can hardly be overemphasized was read together with John Scott's The Politics of the Whale and Mahmoud's Politics of Piety then. So what can be gleaned from this is a strong emphasis on politics, on the political uses and misuses of faith, religion, but also of its supposedly enlightened counterpart, secularism. A view from the European periphery which linked allegedly secular Europe proper, with uh, decidedly Muslim <coughs> Middle East and Northern Africa, was reinforced by a personal note from a, a, a friend of mine from Bosnia, Erna Muric, of my age, who back then uh, decided to put on a whale, even though she, and even though it's with um, uh, quote-unquote here, she declared herself feminist. This piece of personal declaration at the beginning of 2010s uh, or testimony, relatively uncommon uh, at the time, provided us with a real voice from our own neighborhood. One might wonder why talking about whaling in Serbia, where there is only a small Muslim minority, and why should that be a case for understanding the constellation of post-colonial world, patriarchy, and power? To understand an answer to this question, one needs to remember several factors, some of which also Salah Mahmoud underscored in the preface to the politics of piety. Apart from having a solid experience, and we all know something about that, solid experience with socialism and with its subduing of religious practices, we also went through a phase of religious revival, and this is something that Saba speaks of, uh, religious revival in socialism aftermath, where Islamic revival was only a part of a larger revival of various religions in this region. Revival which was closely linked to the wars and misunderstandings or even rewriting of our own recent and very distant past, pasts. Uh, it was then also related to the solid feminist bonds uh, which were never entirely broken despite the disastrous and inhumane politics waged in our names. Bonds which are also rested on stark opposition to nationalisms and its religious promulgations, which repatriarchalized re gender roles almost in an instant, as if there were no several decades old legacy of socialism. So not only have we encountered basically the same issues Saba mentions in her recollections of her early Pakistani progressive left environment, such as lack of education and enlightened thinking on the part of the masses, conservative influences from the politically dissident diaspora, mimetic effects of repressive regimes on the populace itself, all of these accompanied with well-honed secular, liberal and progressive sensibilities and secular epistemology. But we also had to tackle the issue of feminist solidarity based on an implicit or explicit projection of religion and what its survival implied for women and the society as a whole. What Saba urges us to always take into account, I would say, is the unflinching importance of the cultural translation and our readiness to be changed by its process as we become touched by the material practices and mores we have not been able to assume in advance. 
She shows how the constant and multi-directional work of translation affects both ethics and politics. Now, politics in many dimensions, for example, among the presumably conservative groups from a liberal vantage point, among the oppositional groups in one society, among the ethnographer and her informants, among feminists and women as a wide group with very indefinite borders, among Westerners and others, finally, amongst us scholars. Her politics of piety calls for a scrutinous grasp at resistance, <coughs> something crucial for any thought and action that tends to see itself as radical. What really is resistance? And what do we get if we particularize resistances or if we universalize it and claim that there is only one legitimate resistance to power? I still find it critical to ask these two questions posed by Mahmoud. The first one, is it possible to identify a universal category of acts, such as those of resistance, outside of the ethical and political conditions within which they acquire their particular meaning? And the second, does the category of resistance impose a teleology of progressive politics on the analytics of power? She teaches us that we need to understand when our analysis are prescriptive and to understand what such prescriptivity really entails. The need to con contextualize our struggles, and with this I will be finishing, to understand them as historically and symbolically specific, even if these histories are not too big, these portions of history are not too big, also offers a different meaning and sense of agency, as Zilk also said, which cannot be fixed in advance. I find Mahmoud's warning that we should strive to keep the meaning of agency open and to even delink it from the goals of progressive politics, an extremely significant one, both for our analysis and for our feminist struggles today, especially when they are mirrored with our own one specific framings of what a struggle, resistance, and agency means. Thank you. Hvala puno, Adriana. Sekulna, Adriana. Da, ali sekularno u smislu senzibiliteta, a ne legitimiteta. Ja bih sada prešla odmah na Senku, jer mislim da će biti nakon svih izlaganja i mogućnost da se razvije jedna lijepa Lijepi dialog i između naše sagovornice, tako da neću budu. Hvala, ja bih se isto zahvala naravno Sanji na organizaciji i na pozivu. Mislim da nećemo imati dovoljno vremena za diskusiju, obzirom na pitanja koja su se otvorila, pa ću ja zapravo krenuti odmah sa onim što bih željela reći. Ja ću prvo u svakom slučaju dati mali sažetak iz sabne knjige Religious Difference in Secular Age. Ja jesam sociokulturna antropologinja, ne bavim se pitanjem religije, ali bavim se pitanjem politika različitosti, to jest manjinama i na koji način je bilo koja različitost konstruirana, što je uključeno i isključeno u tom konstruiranju pa bih ja sad počela na engleskom. In her book Religious Difference in the Secular Age, Saba Mahmoud focused on the analysis of the management of the religious difference. According to her, today it's common to talk about religion as prior. Is it better now? And to conceive of religious liberty as individual human right. So religion has been relegated to the private sphere, and from its inception, this divide, private, public, established a framework in which religious liberty was related to the notion of minority. But minorities, in this case, religious minorities, don't simply signify demographic entities that are given a space of freedom. 
they also produce to the process of the legal qualification and religious liberty. So one of the key questions that guards Saba's work is, this is the quote, how the discourse of the religious liberty has participated in the production of the minority problem and the international law, and how this problem has unfolded in the history of the modern Middle East. Specifically, she focused on Coptic Christian relation with Muslim majority in Egypt. By doing genealogy of the category secular, Mahmoud shows its regulatory dimensions, its hierarchical divisions, colonial legacy, new national divides between majority and minority, the public-private division, and the forms of gender inequality. She urges us to think critically about the complexity of these issues about the secular religious governance, both national and international, that define what counts as an act of religious prosecution, with specific notion of freedom and unfreedom, is possible and imaginable within this governance. In addition to her analysis of secularism as a legal political discourse that reorders religious life and identity, Mahmoud also paid attention to secularity as a shared set of assumptions that imbue secular society and subjectivity and make the divide between public and private not just possible, but normalized. In my own opinion, Mahmoud's work is highly relevant for us here in Croatia. In contemporary secular Croatia, Catholicism functions as a dominant mode of belonging. We witness almost on the everyday basis how the link between patriotism Catholicism, family, and sexuality has been made. So we can say that in the contemporary Croatia, resurgence of nationalism is grounded in the categories that are relegated to the so-called private sphere. Here I agree with Lauren Delan, who argues that in present days, and she talks about America since the Reagan Revolution, the private sphere, or intimacy, has come to act as an arena to which public questions are addressed, putting on display a mass experience of economic insecurity, class conflict, and religious as well as sexual unease, creating an intimate public sphere, place of used ideology and everyday practices. So in Croatia, the intimate public sphere is linked to the identity crisis accompanied by the call for new morality since the struggles for independence in the 1990s. Plus, like many European countries, Croatia has been affected by the global financial crisis, and austerity measures have been introduced, mixing complicated set of relations between economic, ethnic, religious, and sexual processes. So during the past few years, both right and left major party and political groups, as well as NGOs, have exploded sex, marriage, reproduction, developing new national politics of intimacy. Technologies that produce this new national politics in Croatia are diverse and include articulation of different elements, such as narratives about war veterans, socialist past, demography issues, decreasing fertility rates, anti-abortion and pro-life activism, or activities advocating the rights of unborn children. Croatian unborn children, to be more precise. <laughs> Thus, we can say that a solid platform has been established which stimulates citizens to support and form caring community, or as one Australian anthropologist would say, worrying communities, in accord with desired social values as advocated by the proponents of the new conservative political spectrum. What is common to the most prominent of these worrying citizens is that they stress what they see as the relation between Catholicism, nature, and nation. Any opposition to their moral values, all those who feel that the life is not deliverable within these constraints, are seen as a national threat, or against nature, or against Catholicism. So Catholicism here doesn't refer to the religious practice, or to the belief in God, but to the moral sense of rightness, which is represented as being grounded in Christian values and is seen as the dominant mode of belonging to the nation. In that name, signatures for two referendums are collected, 
1, 2013, as you know, when the people of Croatia decided to constitutionally define marriage as a unity between a man and a woman, and 1, 2018, where the people of Croatia are supposed to decide about demand for less rights for parliamentary <coughs> representatives of national minorities. So if we follow Mahmoud, to go back to Mahmoud, or we continue to think with Mahmoud, we need to explore the framework which have enabled these nationalist exclusionary narratives and actions which promote ethnic, religious, and heterosexual purity and singularity. Or to put it in other words, we have to try to think of what is longer history by which these current narratives and actions have been produced globally and locally. Locally speaking, in Croatia, these narratives have produced more inequalities, more exclusionary practices, which resulted in different kinds of discriminations, like, for example, work discrimination against sexual, national, and religious minorities. Opposing voices to these discriminations often call for the state to become more involved, to become more secular, to provide the equality for all. A call, as Mahmoud argues, that is understood to be demand for the separation of state and religion, but it is in fact a call for sovereign power to serve as the arbiter of equality. But to finish with Mahmoud's question, how we can expect the modern state to serve as the arbiter of equality when its institutions and practices are shaped by the dominant religious and cultural norms. That is, these dominant norms are part of the nation's identity and they allow for inequalities to grow in society, while at the same time they are characterized as a neutral or even natural. Or in other words, she is asking us to think about equality without finishing in the same frame or gap created by present-time liberal democracies and private public divide. Thank you very much, Senka, for this minority report, which is the subtitle of Sada's book. Uh, and please, Sanja, continue. Hvala što ste me pozvali kao drugu antropologiju ovdje da uđe u neku su dialoga sa Sabom Mahmud i odgovori na neki način na pitanje šta nam znači knjiga, tako je bio zadatak, vjerske razlike u sekularnom dobu. Hvala organizatorima da prijatelji. Još jednom i ja ću pokušati sada dati neko svoje čitanje, jedan svoj dialog sa tom knjigom na englaskom jeziku. Dakle, so I'm going to talk in English and I would like to somehow to think, to ask you or invite you to think about my reading of Sabah Mahmoud's religions, uh, religious difference in a secular age as not uh, quarrelsome, but sometimes not uh, so much along the lines of what she argued there. So my address here will go, well, how I titled this uh, for myself, this presentation is, is Secularism on Trial in, in this Sabah Mahmoud's book. My address will go in two directions. First, I'd like to comment upon so-called flaws of incomplete secularism, uh, seen as the, as the major instigator of new inequalities in the Middle East. That particular argu argument in Salah Mahmoud's religious difference in a secular age shows that mechanisms of your American secular polity, as argued by Mahmoud, had an overarching influence on the minoritization of selected religious minorities as well as producing inequalities among different religious minorities. The blame for harsh realities of religious minorities in the Middle East, in particular discrimination against Coptic um, uh, Orthodox Christian minority and Baha'i community, uh, 
and much less known to all of us. It's attributed to faulty conceptualization of religious equality as practiced and preached by secular Egypt polity. So the book is about, as I see it, as Mahmoud claimed of, I'm citing, how secular government contributed to violence and religious tensions in post-colonial Egypt. Secondly, uh, I would like to address and draw connection with some of Mahmoud's insights about incomplete secularism and the relevance it may have for a historically specific development of conservatism, religious traditionalism and anti-secularism in, if I may say so, our region. And here I'm not into contesting national borders and the legitimacy of sovereignty of any of, of the newly founded uh, states in the Balkan, but pointing to the feature of their recent past they all share, and that is an experience of secular governments for half a century in stop a Yugoslav communist government. So I'd like uh, to pay attention to a particular version of Croatian secular sovereignty and governmentality that has emerged after the solution of Yugoslavia and from, uh, through the homeland war in the 90s and has been exercised onwards. Also an ethnographic account on, on violence and, and the production of, of inequalities in so-called secular state. To go back to Mahmoud's religious difference in the secular age and to the central argument bounded around state practice of secularism and secularity in Egypt. I have to explain how she came to argue that secularism has become an instrument of prejudice <coughs> and intolerance. These are her words. First part of the argument addresses the uh, coercive nature of secularism in the Middle East and its connection to the uh, colonial project. The way it overruled the cultural needs, religious specificities, contingent historical and political struggles, and imposed a governance that was alien to the population and harmful to the ways they lived their life and experienced self selfhood. Particularly so in how this coercive secularism separated religion from the state, religious beliefs, religious practices, religious rules from the state beliefs, state practices and state rules. The second part of the argument moves from the colonial uh, perspective and goes back or goes for an attack uh, on secularism itself as I see it. So pardon me for my harsh words. If Sir Mahmoud makes her case on today's legal political discourse, and practice of secular governments, Egypt and European uh, alike, arguing that secularism as legal political discourse by reorder, uh, reordering a religious life and identity generates new forms of inequality. And that is uh, where I'm not comfortable or fully convinced of her arguments. Is it really secularism that generates inequality? should be named somehow or something else. For sure, secular government and polities, secular judges and secular courts produce laws and judicial decisions that generate inequality. They may do it in the name of secularism. They are even obliged and usually swore to constitutional secularism by the appointment to their offices. They sometimes interpret their wrongdoing, unjust laws, particularistic rulings by secularism. But I don't believe it's secularism that they are practicing. What Mahmoud was saying and certainly clearly documented in her analysis of selected legal cases uh, and in particular media um, controversy around the publication of one book is that secularism is haunted by its practice of undoing its own first rule of providing equal access to political and civil rights to all citizens. In other words, what she was saying is that, the, that once the power of a setting, interpreting and enforcing rights and wrongs has shifted from the religious governance to the state governance and the secular judicial system, uh, uh, and the, yeah, the secular, uh, once the secular judicial system started exercising its secular power to pronounce final rulings over its citizens, 
the political secularism was challenged to uh, exercise to full extent its own beliefs. Those beliefs that are introduced and instilled in constitutions and informed by the logic of human rights. As Mahmoud vividly showed, neither Egyptian state courts nor European courts for human rights nor several finally or several uh, finally chosen national court systems and their courts in Europe have been exempt from wrongdoing religious minorities while practicing so-called secular law, secular values and secular beliefs. But the problem as I see it, and here I appear as an avid defender and believer in a secular state, hoping not to do injustice to Salah Mahmoud's arguments, is not the one of separation of religion and state, or the relegation of the religious beliefs and practices to private sphere and to the realm of domestic issues, but the one of the forceful and untold full implementation of secularism and secularity that is not at all secular. The same goes for European secularism as for Egypt secularism. The European secularism is challenged by the problem of the inability or unwillingness to provide and ensure equal rights to all of its citizens, religious minority groups in particular, Muslims being at the center or in the center of European imaginary of the imminent threat to secular polity and cultural identity. Exceptionalist logic of the state secularism in Egypt, as Mahmoud insight insightfully shows, backfired in a number of ways, but with reversed majoritarian minoritarian order. There, the Christians are an imminent threat, and the particular group of Christians, the minority Christians. In the case of Egypt, it was condu uh, conducted in repressing religious identity of Orthodox Copts, Christian Copts, and Baha'is, but also in having to deal with the consequences of releasing private legal issues to the religious family laws. Unlike in the saying that judicial exceptions are believed to confirm the wisdom of the general or universal rule to which we all abide, in Mahmoud's examples from the Egypt, these exceptions showed the internal conflict in secular polity and jurisprudence. The one that arises from the inability to exercise secular ideas and jurisprudence because of ambiguous and conflicting constitutional frameworks that at the same time evokes equality but then imposes that not all citizens are equal since this constitutional and secular jurisprudence is obtainable only to Muslims and acknowledged religious minorities, Christian and Jewish. But to go further from uh, the argument that secularism should be regarded only through the lenses of how secular state treat religious majorities and which kind of constitutional pact they have with religious majorities and how they treat their own religious minorities and did they constitute, 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 constitute nationalize them. I have to ask uh, what is secular governance? Who is secular subject? And to what aim secularism and secularity serves? Did I get it wrong from the Mahmoud's book? Does secularism and secularity serve religious majority to impose its majoritarian values over religious minority? Am I wrong to assert that Mahmoud's proposal from the end of the book that calls for a new imaginary of the state that will not be the only arbiter in majority-minority relations is unsound? and utopia, and I don't think badly of utopias, and that the religious laws handling of intra and inter-religious conflicts have been historically proven to accommodate religious differences with flexibility and particular care of context being more fair than secular laws and practices of today. It seems like the critique of secular state after reading Mahmoud's book should start with dismantling of secularism as we know it. But should we dismantle the secular state as the guarantee of any resemblance of the idea of humanistic ideal of human equality? Or should we dismantle the secular state as the agent who makes, uh, who violates, uh, violates its minority? Is it secularism something more than the divided religious national rationale from the state rationale? 
And this is where I proceed, proceeded to tackle the wisdom put in the secular rule to self-constricts the effects dominant groups exercise or might exercise over minority groups. This is, for me, the idea of secular state. It's care of and over rights of minorities. The state rule that has come to peace with the notion of composite, heterogeneous, pluralistic citizenry that is in the heart of secular state and governance. From this vantage point, I come to comment on how uh, uh, secular is creation secular state. Give me two more minutes. Inspired by all means with Mahmoud's ideas that the secular governance in a number of well documented cases had failed and is still failing its citizens the promise of equality. The failing unravels itself usually in favoring majoritarian notions, ideas, values, and symbols that in no way relate to secular ideas of human rights. Sanka Bolzic has spoken here on this problem, but I would like to comment on the idea of incompleteness of secularization as one of, uh, of the mystification about secular rule and practice. I would like to share an idea that the process of secularization should not be thinking of it, thought of as, a, as finished and complete from its, since from its inception and its various displays, it is meant to handle, um, to take care of societal changes in historically, challenges in historically specific and time-bound contexts. Thus, secularism uh, is a timely concept, it's relational and changing. This, is the, this definition applies to Croatia as well. It applies to the introduction of secularism in Yugoslavia as well as to what is left of secularism in Croatia today. I'm not going to challenge the secular polity of Yugoslavia and how it was conducted, on behalf of whom, nor I will put much effort in discuss how it, it, it is perceived nowadays. But there is this linkage between the modern state project of Yugoslavia, socialist Yugoslavia, communism and Croatian independency that does complicate and contribute to the fading value of secularism and secularity. Does the secular attitude prevail among citizens of Croatia? I would dare to say no. Why is so? The one of the reasons is independence won in the war that sharpened national and religious identities and differences as substantial for one our own self-understanding and self-appreciation. Our new state was reinvented on Catholic and Christian values. The other is directly, uh, the, the other reason is uh, um, uh, linked to perception of secularism as alien, foreign, coercive, communist remnant, and the threat to religious beliefs, cultural values, and traditions of Croatian Christian majority. How do we as Croatians then practice secular pluralist democracy and our liberal state? Who are Croatian minorities and how they encounter state's discriminative practices and why? So, who are those minorities? Give, let me give you a um, quick ethnography. If they are forced migrants and aliens, they won't be granted asylum. If they are gay people, they will be granted the right to uh, legalize partnership after years of legal struggle, petitioning, and advocacy, and finally, the le uh, uh, legal partnership was legalized throughout uh, our laws. But they will not be given the right to bear and raise or adopt child, children. If they are single parents, believing they are minority. They almost lost their rights to be perceived as family and exercise family rights. If they are Muslim women and want to take an official photo for an official ID document with a head cover, they will have to sue the state. So if they are Roma people with the children of school age, they might be advised to unregister their children from the school one school and moved to the other school due to the pressure of parental advisory boards and the school administration and the threat that the white Croatian children will not attend classes in which gypsy children outnumber Croatians. If there are secular Croatian parents of school age children who did not opt for religious education in public schools for their children, they might be struck or stuck with a fact that their children do not have a substitute, mind the word, class, but wander around school unsupervised while the Catholic children go to, to their classes, religious classes. If they are public intellectuals, writer, writers, filmmakers, theater and film directors, they can be harassed on a daily basis, publicly attacked, symbolically and financially penalized for their 
pointing to discriminatory practices of the secular state. Still believe in a secular state, uh, the very state whose majority of citizens had to um, uh, manage to infringe on the constitution and un egalitarian and deeply discriminatory clauses on the idea of family. Um, so we live in a state uh, uh, whose very majority works nowadays, and Senka, as Senka mentioned, on the overruling of the rights of national minorities from the preferential representation in parliament, and they work uh, to make this a constitutional rule. This very majority in a secular state works on the overruling of the Istanbul Convention that regulates sexual harassment, abuse of women, and asks for gender equality. In this context, I do agree with Mahmoud that secular uh, secularism or secular state produces inequalities within its own discursive and material practices. It does so by doings and by omissions to do rights to religious minorities, ethnic minorities, racial minorities, sexual minorities, women, even to the secular minority in the secular state. It does so by producing minorities on an everyday basis. But it is not secularism we are talking about here. That's something much more vicious. Thank you. Hvala puno, Sanja. Moja intuicija o poredku je potpuno pogodila. Jer ne samo da imamo ovdje prisutne osobe koje su intelektualno jako snažne, već su i aktivistine, odnosno militantne, pobornice onoga zašto trebamo se izboriti kada je reč o pravima manjine, koje god da je su manjine u pitanju. Ali prije nego dam riječ našim sugovornicama da između sebe razmijene nekoliko komentara ili pitanja, ja bih samo osunula se i na samu riječ sekularnost, odnosno sekularizam, pomenuši da sam imala problem sama čitajući i tumačeći je i pomogla sam se riječnikom Barbara Kassan o u stvari to je riječnik neprevodivih riječi filozofski riječnik neprevodivih riječi u kojem je ona za sam sam pojam sekularizacije dakle na francuskom sekularizacijom, dodala i reč profanacijom. Blisko polje, sematiško polje sekularizacije bi onda bili beruf, bildung, bogočolovečenstvo, desenganjo, dje, nojcajt, pjetas, praksis, religijo, ali isto tako romantike, sobornost, stato i velt, na kraju velt. Evo, sad bih pustila naše sugovnice da između sebe ostaje pitanje o tome. Well, I, I would be very, very brief, and this is really the question for this table, I would say, uh, and link myself to the last sentence of, of your, your text, which I think is very important, because what is this that is so vicious? If it's, uh, if it's not secularism, then what is it? Uh, um, some years ago, 10 years ago, uh, when was it that, the, is it critique secular? Some years ago? 10 years ago. Um, that book was very controversial, controversial, I would say, 2009. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the conference was uh, uh, in 2008. 
Well, in any case, we could have asked his critique secular at that time, and that would be a really a controversial question. Now, 10 years after, um, um, when we have gender ideology as a very dominant trend, and as a very international, strong trend, um, are we going to take it for granted, and how are we going to, how are we going to tackle, tackle, tackle this issue? I think we began as, as probing the divide between secularism and religious feminisms, and then we had some, some so to say, proofs that secularism is now endangered, or is, is in guise, but what is that vicious thing? <laughs> How do we deal with that? <laughs> um, something in, in me tells me, do not enter this debate at all. <laughs> you know, you've had a very nice time in Jamaica. Everyone's been very kind. Um, all right, just a couple of things. First of all, perhaps uh, to address Adriana's question, um, the anti-gender ideology movement, yes, has its origins in part in the Vatican's Family Council and also in the um, uh, right-wing evangelical appropriation of the formulation that gender is a diabolical ideology. Um, but if you look across the world, there are um, Christian churches that are opposing this movement and that we actually have very serious divisions within Catholicism and even um, uh, within uh, the different evangelical um, uh, communities depending on the region. Um, it seems to me that gender ideology, um, uh, the anti-gender ideology movement is, um, is not simply trying to bring us back to religion, but to um, um, a uh, gender conservatism that has fixed roles for men and women and hierarchy and hi understood on a hierarchical level. And it is most often, when it's not referencing the Bible to say, God said there was this difference, and then gender theory came along and said it didn't exist. <laughs> Um, uh, it's also really um, talking about the gender division of labor in very specific national contexts and with very strong nationalist aims. So it's unclear to me whether the nationalism and the gender conservatism is using the church um, position or whether the church is implicated to some degree, but it is a reaction um, against certain kinds of major um, movements in the world that have um, uh, that have affirmed the reproductive rights of women, that have affirmed um, the um, the rights of trans people to choose their sex or to change their legal status, um, gay and lesbian marriage. Uh, feminist equality. Now, that reaction certainly to some degree comes through a religious form, but not necessarily. There's a right-wing secular reaction as well. And what's also interesting and somewhat mm, contradictory about the anti-gender ideology movement is that um, it sometimes says there's scientific fact, and sometimes it says God made this difference. And then you ask whether the science they have in mind, but which century does the science belong to, right? Because the idea of nat you know, sometimes then it's suddenly natural law, at which point we realize that this is a very specific, specific scholastic appropriation of Aristotle within Catholicism that's being reanimated for a very specific ideological purpose. I love it that we're targeting Aristotle on natural teleologies. Yes. Um, back to Beauvoir. Okay, so um, so I'm not sure 
um, uh, we should worry there are right-wing psychiatrists, ultra-secular, who are anti-gender, right? Have no relationship um, to those religious frameworks. Secondly, I would say that Salah Mahmoud never called for the dismantling of a secular state in favor of a religious state. That was not her aim. Um, uh, in fact, she depended very much on the extension of rights of, um, that would protect religious minorities. She argued in France that they did not have an adequate concept of religious minorities and that religious minorities in France deserve legal protection. And that was an extension of um, secular law. What, what she was worried about was that the extension of certain kinds of secular rights would start to define the phenomenon so that religion would become a belief. She didn't think religion was, in many contexts, religion is not a belief or a set of beliefs or an idea, right? Or, um, uh, and, and indeed, if you think about the way she um, describes the practices um, um, among observant women in Cairo, um, it's an embodied and ethical practice. And if you think about why she didn't think the law had a way of understanding the um, widespread outrage against um, the Danish cartoons, it's because the image of Muhammad is, is an extension of the self. It, it, is, it, is, it is an injury to one's own body, to one's own self, it, because the self is relational and it is articulated in part through that relationship to the image so the image is not out there. It's like people say, well, you know, imagery is expression and should be. But that's not how the image functions. So we, we fail to be able to describe the phenomenon or understand the outrage or even um, respond to it uh, in a knowing and effective way. So, um, but she lived with that paradox and she was extremely interested in family law in Egypt where, or you know, even in India or Pakistan where you actually have two different court systems that have to reconcile themselves with one another. Um, and that was a way for the secular to exist and to do its function, but for there to be a kind of movement for people who also have very strong um, uh, um, religious commitments or modes of belonging to, um, to, to navigate dual legal systems. And that involved hermeneutics, involved judgment, involved interpretation, involved reconciliation. It didn't let the law totally totalize the phenomenon. So, you know, she was not against uh, all forms of secularism or all possibilities of secularism. I think the term secularity became important for Edward Said. And the truth is that there's a very strong tension between Said's notion of secularity and um, Talal Assad's notion of secularism. So I don't think we can reconcile them too quickly. Um, um, I think she was, was worried uh, uh, that, um, that secularity was a cosmopolitan sensibility, which was a way of producing a secular ethos, but she didn't think that was um, uh, necessarily the best way to affirm religious difference. Um, in fact, she was very worried that it um, uh, that it not only undercut that understanding but managed it in ways that made religion unrecognizable. So we have to allow that tension to stand. I think. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I I can't really represent her even though I spoke in her voice, as it were. But that's my understanding. Of Imamo još 15 minuta i ja sam sigurna da imaju publici neko ko bi mogao komentarisati i ko bi mogao biti prozvan da pita pitanje. Ima je bitar, pa da ne stilo. This silence is also for Sava. 
because this is a this is a tension. <laughs> but maybe yes, yeah. I'm not going to ask questions, just maybe a few comments. And uh, mostly, um, actually, Sonia, I'm going to ask you, because you mentioned a few times, you know, that uh, the way how I read Saba's work is uh, she's asking us to do genealogy of every single category, which we somehow take uh, for granted. And secularism is just one of them. And effects of secularism, I'm actually very grateful to, to Saba that I started to think about secularism as one of these categories. You know, which, and uh, so you mentioned a few times, you know, it's like uh, secularism, <coughs> what they do in the name of secularism is not a secularism. So does it mean that you think that there is a pure category of secularism? <laughs> Sorry. Does that because but, uh, yeah how yeah I, I just couldn't understand what you really want to say so how is uh, because the way how secularism is functioning at the moment secular state is functioning at the moment in Croatia is highly related to uh, the rest of the world especially the West you know and the way how they are trying to cope with some things. I was even thinking how the notion of secularism in Croatia is in a way similar to this one in Egypt, because people often say, oh, the reason it's not complete, you know, we don't have a state with it. It's, it's, it's not the same like in Germany, for example, or somewhere else, you know, in the Western countries, it's not, not enough, not enough of it. So uh, how you see it, what is it, you know, when you say they, they, they do it in the name of secularism, because that's exactly, I think, you know, what is the part of, uh, of, 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 of her argument, you know, that we see effects of a secular state, you know, and the secularism and all these. That's why I was thinking, you know, that the politics of intimacy, which Berlant is talking about, is somehow interesting to think together, it's even though they're uh, completely different, you know, but what is happening right now and that the secular state is somehow dislocating, you know, some of these things about which we think, you know, that are related to the notion of secularity to this intimate public sphere. And together with the citizens, together with us, is shocked, you know, that something bad is happening when people don't have houses, shelters, and there are discriminations. So we have mayors of the cities, we have politicians who are shocked together with us, you know, and uh, so when we talk about this notion of secularity and the bodies, you know, which is an, an, an embodiment of secularity, how, how it's lived, I think that this notion of politics of intimacy, you know, and this sense of morality is somehow defining it. So, yeah, that's for you, in terms of what is for you, this, there is no... Who are they? You want me to ask uh, to answer this question? So I was thinking, particularly, and I was referring to them, to those protagonists, whom Saba Mahmoud um, <coughs> mentioned, or through whom she created this very complex picture of what went wrong with secular state, Egypt secular state, and let's say Europe, uh, a number of European secular state. And who, who are those people? Not people. Those are court, state courts on all levels. She says that what she does in her book, she analyzes the discourse of a courts, juris, uh, how to say it, uh, um, which is verdicts. So we have names and we have functions of those peoples, the representatives of the secular state. Then there is a president. Then the, these are functions of, of, of the state. So those are the people whom she's writing about and on the other side is not a secular it, it is a subject that's why I ask who is a subject in secular state for a secular subject 
is a, a rel religious, uh, a person, usually a person f who is an, uh, a part in, in some judiciary case usually a person, a religious person from Coptic minority, Baha'i minority, not a secular subject. It is, a, he is, or she, or they are, uh, at the very same time, as subjects to the secular state, themselves somehow encompassed with the secularism, but they act in this play as religious subjects. So when I try to make this analogy, like talking about that, I was thinking of a representatives of government uh, who create uh, secular policy and exercise secular governance in Croatia. And then I was thinking of the statues, or I was trying to imagine who is this secular subject in Croatia to whom this state wants to provide um, um, equal access to civil and political rights. So it was just my puzzle with this book is that I could not, uh, I could not find a secular subject in this book, and. The pro my problem comes because of my feeling of being a minority by being secular in a secular state. Did I manage to? <laughs> I, I think that Rebecca can add a few words. I have a feeling like talking about. <laughs> Uh, ono što i uh, Peter Berger kaže, možemo imati sekularnu državu, a da društvo nije sekularno. Kad gledamo našu situaciju u Hrvatskoj, mi imamo državu koja je sekularna, zakon i tako dalje, i društvo koje očito nije sekularno. I sad, uh, utjecaj, uh, ili koliko zapravo država može i ostati sekularna, ako je društvo ovako pritisak snažan, i to nije više pritisak samo u Hrvatskoj. Mi gotovo imamo neku agendu na razine Europe koja pokušava, ja bih skoro rekla, ugroziti se koju na tu državu. Ja imam dojam kao da bi se željeli vratiti u neko predmodernu doba ili neku želju za uspostavom, recimo kod nas u Hrvatskoj ili u katoličkim zemljama, kršćanskog društva. Da, još. Ali to ide i dalje. To ide dalje. Znači, jedna sam se nameće takav javni diskurs da određene vrednote predstavljaju se bez kritičkog promišljanja što one zapravo znači i kako izgledaju izvorno kršćanske vrednote. One se predstavljaju kao norma koja sam da nameće. A zapravo te vrednote, ako bismo baš izgledati iz kršćanske perspektive, mogli bismo ih malo i drugačije formulirati. I mislim, Judith Butler jako dobro rekla da mi i u samoj katoličkoj crkvi imamo jednu živu raspravu u odnosu na rod, u odnosu na manjine bilo koje vrste i da teolozije ne prihvaćaju tako lako ovaj diskurs koji se nameće kao katolički literature postoji jako puno. Problem je samo to ono što hierarhija podržava ovaj diskurs koji se pojavljuje u javnost. Ali, kažem, meni je pitanje to upravo sekularno, koliko je društvo sekularno. Mislim da bi tu sad sociolozi mogli pokazati je li u istinu ili mi zapravo imamo jednu manjinu koja daje dojem da društvo nije sekularno. Možda ta manjina je toliko glasna da daje dojem. Recimo, sad ću možda malo, ne baš toliko previše sustavno, znači očekivalo bi se ako je društvo, na primjer, kršćansko, 
kad je pitanje pobačaja, da će se onda većina izjasniti protiv pobačaja. Da, protiv pobačaja. Mi kad vidimo u Hrvatskoj, sve agenda pokazuju da su ljudi tu jako suzdržani, pa bi radili da ostane zakon koji omogućava pobačaj. Tako da, kažem, pitanje te sekularnosti ili nesekularnosti društva, to je trebalo provjeriti, ali mi bi se nadači dojam kao da je pritisak na politiku i na sve, da se promijene i zakone, tako da i država više ne bude sekularna. Moj problem je šta je problem u sekularnosti, osim ovoga, da nekad da djeluje, da su se, neću povući ako vic o tarabi, dakle, piše sekularna, jer država se zove sekularna i ona čini, dakle, stanovite, stanovite nasilje protiv različitih vrsta manjina, ovdje specifično religijskih manjina, ali što je sekularno u tome? Dakle, kada neko čini neki, kako da kažem, katolik čini nešto što vam se čini da oponira jednoj kršćanskoj doktrini, oponira svom vlastitom poglavaru, svom praksom. On je još uvijek katolik, ali zapravo vi mislite da on nije, jer ne čini dobro. Tako se ja pitam da li je imao, koja je logika u argumentima stavljena hmut, kada na neki način problem sa religijskim načinom koji se religijske manjine diskriminiraju u Evropi i u Egiptu artikulira kao problem sekularne države. Ja bih samo kratko sve. Ja ću samo kratko sve pomisliti da smo izašli u vremena. Kako je uopće, Sara Mahmud radi genologiju, kako je uopće došlo do toga da u današnje vrijeme govorimo o problemima kao što su abortis, kao što je to prava obitelj, može li žena bez sjednih djeta, muči žena bez djeca i jesu li obitelj. Kako je uopće došlo do toga da mi danas govorimo o tim pitanjima i razgledamo o tim pitanjima. Govorimo o pravima o kojima danas zapravo govorimo. Svoje vremeno smo mislili da više nikad nećemo na taj način o tome razgovarati. To je ono što, do čega smo došli, što je jedan od efekata sekularne države i podjela koje su nastavili prava. Po meni je sjajno to što Sava Mahmud veže ljudska prava i problematizira ljudska prava. Da li je borba za jednakost svih nas pred zakonom isključivo moguće ako razmišljamo o kategorijama ljudskih prava. Jesu li to zapravo najbolje kategorije prebo kojih molimo do toga doći? Zašto ne bismo o tome ponovo pomislili? Da li te kategorije ljudskih prava nas ponovo stavljaju u određene okvire? Zašto uopće moramo govoriti o romskoj djeci kao o romskoj djeci? koja su onda na određeni način odvojena i tako daj. Zašto manjinu bez prestanka pozicioniramo na način na koji je pozicionira? Sada vam ako govori o religijskim, koji će se bavila nekim drugim pitanjima, međutim mi se čini da činimo da je to izuzetno nešto što je vrijedno u njenom radu, ponovo nas podsjetiti da iznova moramo promatrati svaki unaprijed zadan, svaki unaprijed zadan u podijelu kako stoji uopće u društvu kategorizaciju i u našoj borbi za prava ih jako često reproduciramo. Ja u Hrvatskoj vidim da često reproduciramo kroz proteste na koje idemo, ja sama idem na njih i svijesno sam u koliko mjeri ponekad reproduciramo i da li te nejednakosti i granice nove stvaramo bez presne. To je produkt sekularnosti, ja bih se tu složila sa za Mahmo, da očigledno je za neku dužu diskusiju. This all reminds us what we've heard during the Monday evening on interpreting non-violence in the city theater, I think. Well, one more time. Are there any questions? Yes, please. 
respecting the conflict the whole time because it's a super um, interesting debate and um, English is not my native language and I live in Germany and German is also not my native language. Um, is there any possibility that you could say in two phrases what I also cannot read? Uh, Rebecca? Yes. Rebecca. Um, what you, because I, I have the sense that it's super, does it, that it's very interesting and engaging and I would just very uh, much like to understand what this is. And also... Can you, can you just uh, repeat your question? Yeah, like if you could, if you could, like in just two phrases, in just two sentences, uh, or three, I don't know, like just uh, repeat Rebecca's statement and thank us. If not, if not possible, then please. Then. Oh. Oh, I understand it. I actually wrote a little note about this. Um, hold on one second. I'll just get it. Uh, in the in the actual presentation, um, she mentioned that she would like to see us overcome the division between religion and secularism, and she also thought it was possible to return anthropology to the study of theology. That that would be an important thing to do. Um, and um, she thought that a purely secular feminism could be understood as provincial, or she cited someone who said that, and she cited it in an affirmative way, um, <laughs> because it is provincial to have contempt for religion. It's just a failure of understanding, right? I totally agree. Um, I believe she also claimed um, that the Catholic Church allowed secularism inside its door when it adopted Aristotle, and that was a mistake. <laughs> um, and that, as I read it, she wanted to get rid of natural teleology, um, which I would add is the basis of the anti-gender uh, ideology. She also said, if I remember correctly, um, uh, that, look, um, this society um, is not secular, but the state is, this one right here. Um, and uh, that this is a tension, this is an ongoing tension. And, um, and that I believe you worried that what's happening right now in that tension is we might actually see a kind of return to a, to a pre-modern situation, and which is as I understood it, one reason she was arguing for cooperation rather than a, a reactive cycle. Thank you. Wow. So we are for positive differences. Uh, Hvala puno na pažnji. Zahvaljujem vam svoje ime, ali u ime naših sagovornica. I sad bismo trebali pogledati naš film Semiotika kuhinje.